In this video, I'll be introducing the concept of intermolecular forces. Have you ever wondered why geckos can hang upside down? Now, some people have the misconception that geckos have sticky feet that physically allow them to adhere to the wall. Contrary to that, gecko feet actually look like this. They contain many tiny hairs called seta, which split out and give a large contact area between the foot and the wall. Gecko's amazing ability to climb walls without using any kind of adhesives have inspired the design of these really cool robots, like this one shown on the lower left, which is called a sticky bot, that can climb walls, again, without any kinds of adhesives. Both the gecko and the sticky bot are powered through intermolecular forces, which are attractive forces between the seta and the wall. Let's dive into this in some more detail. Intermolecular forces are the forces that hold substances together. They describe the interaction between molecules or particles in a sample. An intermolecular force is a force between molecules, and it's generally weaker than an intramolecular force. This being said, it's still strong enough to hold the substances together. One or more different types of intermolecular forces, or IMFs, can be present in a particular sample of particles, and the classification of the intermolecular force or intermolecular forces present will depend on the particle identity. In general, stronger intermolecular forces lead to stronger attraction between particles in the sample, and this determines a lot of physical properties of the sample, such as its boiling point or melting point, as well as the phase of that particular substance at a specific temperature or pressure. We'll be talking about that in more detail in a future video, but for now, it's important to know that stronger intermolecular forces correspond to stronger attraction. There are multiple different types of intermolecular forces, and this table gives an overview of the four main types we'll be discussing today. The first is dispersion, which takes place in all types of atoms and molecules. The second is dipole-dipole, which only takes place between polar molecules. The third is hydrogen bonding, which is a special type of dipole-dipole inter interaction that takes place with molecules having hydrogen bound to specific small electronegative atoms. And the last we'll talk about is ion-dipole, which occurs between ions and polar molecules. It's often said that dispersion is the weakest type of intermolecular force and hydrogen bond is, bonding is the strongest, but this simply isn't true. As you'll notice by the strengths listed on the right-hand side of the table, there's great overlap. If molecules are large enough, which we'll discuss in a minute, they can obtain very substantial dispersion forces between the molecules and can sometimes overcome even the uh, even you know hydrogen bonding it depends a lot on the molecule characteristics in terms of the strength of the types of intermolecular forces we'll talk about each one of these in detail now starting with dispersion forces dispersion forces which are present in all types of matter rely on the distribution of electrons within the molecule Generally, this is referred to as the electron cloud. Electrons within molecules are in constant motion. This means that sometimes atoms can form or molecules can form temporarily, uh, temporary dipoles if the electron distribution becomes temporarily asymmetric. And the idea here is that then if one molecule or atom has a temporary dipole, it will induce temporary dipoles in the surrounding molecules. Now because all atoms and molecules contain electron clouds, intermolecular forces that are classified as dispersion are present in all of them. Let's look at a picture to help us understand this a little bit better. So here I'm showing a picture of three helium atoms. And I'm kind of showing this as a snapshot in time where the electrons are distributed around the nucleus. And again, this is just a, this is just a 
pictorial model to help us to understand dispersion a little bit better. Now imagine, if you will, that in the left-hand helium atom, for at some point, the electrons are on one side of the atom because they're all constantly in motion. And this causes what's called a temporary dipole where there's more electron distribution or more electron density on one side of the molecule than there is on the other. Now what happens is that this temporary electron unevenness within the atom, or this can also be applied to molecules, induces a temporary dipole in the next molecule. And you'll notice that the partially positive end of one atom or molecule, in this case the helium atom, is attracted to the partially negative end. And this positive negative electrostatic interaction, this is the intermolecular force, this is a, a, this is a favorable interaction from an electrostatic standpoint. And you'll notice this, this uh, theme of having a partially positive, partially negative end of an atom or molecule or particle attract each other. That's gonna be present throughout our discussion of intermolecular forces. And what's going to happen is that the next molecule will also induce this partial or this temporary dipole in the next in this case, helium atom. Again, the partially positive end induce or is you know attracted to the partially negative end. And again, another way to say that this is another intermolecular force that the electron, the region that has less electron density, is more attracted to the region with more electron density. Now let's discuss dipole-dipole intermolecular forces. These are only present in samples containing polar molecules. And polar molecules contain permanent dipoles, as we've discussed in a previous video. These types of interactions are referred to as directional because they have a high dependence on the particle orientation. Here's an image showing two HCl molecules interacting. HCl is a polar diatomic, um, chlorine has more electron density than hydrogen. You'll notice this end is the chlorine end of the molecule containing or having higher electron density, and this end is the hydrogen containing end of the molecule having lower electron density. And you can see the illustration here in the electrostatic potential map. Now, the partially negative end, which is represented by the arrow in the dipole, is attracted to the partially positive end of the next molecule. If you were to just draw these electro or these um, dipoles in space, you'd get something like this, where you would have the partially positive end of one attracting the partially negative end of the other. Now this is a favorable interaction. If the molecules were oriented so that their dipole, that the partially negative ends of the dipole were pointing towards each other, this would not be elect, uh, energetically favorable because there would be two regions of high electron density trying to occupy, you know, trying to get close to each other, and that would cause repulsion. So that this is much higher energy and less stable, and this configuration has a lower energy and is therefore more stable. That's what's meant by these dipole dipole forces being directional. Now, as I said before, hydrogen bonding is a special type of dipole-dipole interaction. It's easiest to see what I mean by this if we look at a picture. So here we have two, three different types of molecules. All of these molecules have something in common, which is that they all contain a hydrogen atom that's bound to a small electronegative atom, nit either nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. And then that um, atom is interacting with another nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine on another molecule. Now, chemists refer to this as a hydrogen bond, and all the dashed red lines here are indicating the hydrogen bonds between these three different types of molecules. So the most important part is we have a hydrogen molecule 
bound to a small electronegative atom, and that is interacting with another small electronegative atom. So that's one of the hydrogen bonds. We can repeat this process. Here we have a hydrogen bound to an oxygen, and then that hydrogen is interacting with a fluorine. So here is the other species that are interacting to form this intermolecular hydrogen bond. And then here you'll notice we have a nitrogen atom with a hydrogen bound to it, and this hydrogen atom is interacting with this oxygen atom on this other molecule. Now, although we refer to this as a hydrogen bond, it's not a covalent bond. It's a type of intermolecular force, which means it's a type of force between molecules, not within molecules. Remember, within molecules, that's an intramolecular force or a covalent bond. Intermolecular force strength can be controlled by many factors. We'll discuss some of these in a future video. As a general overview, here are many different types of molecules, and they all exhibit dispersion. This is because all types of molecules exhibit dispersion. Now, generally speaking, the larger the molecule is, the more space the electron clouds will interact with each other, leading to a stronger dispersion force. We'll also discuss some other factors like the shape of the molecule in a future video, but do know that that controls the strength of the dispersion force. Now within this set of molecules, the polar molecules will be will display dipole-dipole interactions. These the strength of a dipole-dipole interaction is classified by the strength of the molecular dipole or the size of the molecular dipole. The more uneven the electrons are distributed within the molecule, the, the larger that dipole and the stronger the intermolecular force would be between the molecules. Now within this set of molecules, only two of them display hydrogen bonding within that a set of those types of molecules because they contain hydrogen bound to a small electronegative atom, which would then need to interact with another small electronegative atom. The strength of hydrogen bonding is controlled by the number of times or the, the, the number of opportunities a specific molecule has for hydrogen bonding. So for example, for water, the hyd each hydrogen atom on the molecule can, can form a hydrogen bond with another oxygen on another water molecule, and the oxygen can form a hydrogen or can, can uh, form a hydrogen bond with another water mo with hydrogens on another water molecule. So there are multiple opportunities for hydrogen bonding within a system containing water molecules. Let's practice by classifying the intermolecular force type or types in this molecule. Pause the video and try to figure it out. So we can for sure say that this molecule contains dispersion as an intermolecular force. And this is because all molecules contain electron clouds or have electron clouds, and therefore those electron clouds can interact in a way um, that induces dispersion intermolecular forces. Now to figure out if the molecule exhibits dipole-dipole, we have to ask ourselves if this is a polar molecule. We know from a previous video that the carbon-oxygen bond is polar and the carbon-hydrogen bond is effectively nonpolar. This renders the entire molecule polar, meaning the partially positive negative end is toward the oxygen, meaning more electron density, and the partially positive end is near the hydrogens, less electron density. Because this is a polar molecule, when two molecules interact, they will exhibit this is a type of dipole-dipole interaction. So there's our dipole-dipole. And by the way, this, in this little dashed line that's representing the intermolecular forces is also representing dispersion by proxy because dispersion forces are also present in attracting these molecules. Now, when figuring out if the molecule exhibits hydrogen bonding, 
Well, in a pure sample of formaldehyde, all we have is formaldehyde molecules. We have an oxygen, which is a small electronegative atom, but you'll notice that it isn't directly bound to a hydrogen. Therefore, hydrogen bonding is not present in a sample of formaldehyde molecules. Therefore, the correct answer here is D. Both dispersion and dipole-dipole forces are present in a sample of formaldehyde, which again is describing the interaction between at least two formaldehyde molecules, if not more. The last intermolecular force I'll touch on are ion-dipole intermolecular forces, which are named appropriately because it has to do with ions interacting with polar molecules. You may have seen a picture of salt dissolving or another ionic solid in water. Some of these pictures show the orientation of the water molecules relative to the ions. Much like our other types of intermolecular forces where we have the partially positive end of the polar molecule will interact with the negative ion. And again, this is this positive negative energetically favorable attraction, which is what causes this to happen in the first place. On the other hand, the partially negative end of the, a polar molecule, such as water, will orient toward the positive ion, in this case, sodium. So this is, the, um, this is what an ion-dipole intermolecular force is. It's an attraction between the polar molecule and each ion within an ionic compound. In this video, we've classified the different types of intermolecular forces, as well as tried out a couple of examples with some different molecules. Here are some bonus practice problems for you to work out to try to classify the types of intermolecular forces present in a pure sample of these substances. First, draw the Lewis structure to determine if the, if the molecule is polar or nonpolar. After that, classify if hydrogen bonding is present by determining if hydrogen is bound to a small electronegative atom in the molecule. Good luck with that, and I will see you in the next video.